All right, so uh, this is our second week. Um, just as a reminder, here's sort of what we're gonna do, um, or here's, where's, here's where we are. Um, so I definitely wanna talk and see how folks were feeling about um, you know, getting started in a way, making sure everything got set up. Um, so we'll do a little bit of just discussion around homework. So if people have work and they wanna post it in our Slack channel, they'd be more than welcome. You're also welcome to just share, share your screen and sort of talk about what you worked on. Um, we're gonna look at some inspiration projects today. Uh, I'll mostly show some projects that I've seen people have done um, in, uh, in Runway. So these are all projects that are feasible, although I will say some of them are pretty, pretty wild and wouldn't expect anyone to do uh, some of them in four weeks, but um, you know, just wanna sort of get you aware of like what other people are working on and maybe give you some ideas on what to work on for yourself. Um, and then we're, we'll do a little bit, um, I wanna talk a little bit about a particular type of model inside of runway called vector uh, inputs. So we'll, we'll cover some of that. Um, maybe some of you came across those models and were either confused or figured out, but want a little behind the scenes detail, uh, we'll do that. And then we'll spend probably the second half of class going over data sets. So um, again, next week we're gonna look at training so you don't have to have a data set ready to go for that training course, um, but it's probably helpful to like start thinking about it and start building one. Um, so we'll go over how to build a data set. I'll do a quick demo of how to use um, a model called, or a, a tool called Instagram Scraper. So we can scrape some Instagram images um, to build a data set. So we'll go over that. And then, um, yeah, so like, you know, if last week was pretty chill because you just like hung out and runway for an hour or two, this week is going to start to feel pretty intense because data sets, like producing a data set, hands down, like the most time intensive thing you'll do. Um, so, you know, get ready for that. Um, obviously, like go at your own pace, but just so you're aware, like data sets are definitely a, uh, a challenge and are definitely one of the harder parts of all of this work. Cool. All right. So, yeah. So, again, um, we'll do some inspiration. Oh, I forgot. We'll talk about chaining really quickly. Um, I'll do a quick demo of how chaining works um, if you're interested, and then we will. Uh, do vector inputs and data sets. We have a lot to cover today. Um, so let's dive right in. So um, homework, uh, did anyone get to make anything cool? I'll quickly jump to our, um, our Slack channel and take a look. Awesome. Um, so I see Claudia. Claudia, do you wanna go through some of the stuff you worked on? Um, okay, yeah, so the first one, um, I think you're still sharing it, or am I sharing it? Oh, you're. Oh, yeah. I'm sharing. Yeah, yeah, I'm sharing. You're good. Yeah. So I did like a quick video the night the night af, af, uh, after the class, and I realized like um, I just like overlaid, a lot, and I know you can't really like export videos, so I just like screen recorded it, and I just mm -hmm. like did a whole bunch of things for fun, um, and then I just like added like music to it, um, oh. and then I took like a couple days off, and then I went back in to just see what other fe uh, features there were. A lot of them, what you were saying, were kind of confusing as far as like vector, and like I was trying to read some of them because I remember you meant you mentioned to go and see kind of like what that type of um, work like module like does or model does, um, and then I couldn't figure out some of the stuff, but I think just because I haven't really gotten there yet. Um, but I real but I realized I think most like most of the stuff is like. If I want to make a video, which I kind of st want to start doing, I either have to do like a lot of like independent photos and just make like a GIF or do just like a screen recording. Um, but it was, it was very interesting to see like, uh, I think what like we went over in class too, where you type in like a sentence and then it creates like this random image. That was, I think the most exciting part for me. And just to see, cause I, I'm a big fan of just tech of just like random like images. So it was always fun to see. And I, and then I guess so, so, someone else kind of mentioned it too, but is there like a better way to save something? Like when I save something, it always name, it always turns out like turns out to be the same name. Um, and then this one I was a little bit confused on too, where like you pick a color or like you pick a subject, like a human and it turns the color red. So I drew like a human and I picked like this thing to do like a skateboard. Um, but I'm wondering like they all kind of look the same. I'm assuming just the colors are different. Um, and then, yeah, that was pretty much it. I, and then I messed with like the home, the Sim, the Simpsons one, which was kind of like not super exciting, um, but it was still kind of fun just cause I'm a big Simpsons fan. So it was just like cool to see like different things take shape. Um, but yeah, that was pretty much it. I should have probably dove into it a little bit more, but 
I was just trying to find stuff that I was interested in. And I was, and the faces to flowers was like my favorite one. So like, I was just doing a lot of those of myself and different angles and stuff. So, yeah. Oh yeah. Thank you. Uh, so this model is a model called spade. Um, I think I have a video on how it works. If I don't, I definitely need to record one. Um, but it's definitely, it's an interesting model and it's what we call uh, segmentation. Um, so uh, if I don't cover it, I won't cover it this week, but I might be able to get to it next week. So, um, and if I find a video, I'll link to that as well. So um, yeah, there's some interesting stuff with this model. Um, and I think the way you're using it is really interesting, but uh, there are other ways to use it that might give you better results. So. <laughs> um, Michael, I saw that you had posted some stuff in here. Do you want to talk about what you did? Yeah, so I was just using um, HIDT, which I guess uh, applies, tries to apply like light, um, some sort of lighting condition to a photo. So I was just like looking at a lot of the details in here um, and really curious about how different and like how to, to kind of give it maybe like an incorrect input and, and understand what, what, like what it thinks it's, what it's trying to do with that. Um, and then particularly like looking around the border of the screen here um, and this sort of hazy background, um, I thought it was really interesting how, like which results ended up creating which kinds of like, you know, maybe more like hazy geometry and where it was a little bit fuzzier. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Like, yeah, now that you pointed out, I see like this one has no sky, right? Or like, it's very like bland. Whereas this, like, I guess it's pulling in. Yeah, I've never actually played with this model. So I don't really know much about it. Um, but yeah, it looks like this is getting a little bit more of the sky in here. And then, you know, this one, I don't even know what it's going to do with the carpet. But yeah, it's cool. Um, nice exploration. Did you have anything else in here that I missed? Uh, no, I had, was playing around too with the, the flower uh, model and cool. with like, um, like PowerPoint slides with a lot of um, like uh, plain color backgrounds. And it was kind of weird, like the shapes that it made like around the subject. Maybe I can post some of those. Cool. Um, all right, oh wow. I, I must have missed that we add, that everyone added work. So this is awesome. Um, Anthony, talk to me about you, what you worked on. Uh, sure, so I, uh, I messed around mostly with uh, StyleGAN 2, actually went into training. Um, I initially was just working with kind of the more practical ones, uh, cropping and also uh, up resing. And then I, I decided to just like start training um, based on some data sets. Of the two images, I just went to like William Sonoma and downloaded a bunch of uh, plate designs. <laughs> and so I trained, I trained one model on that. The other model was just kind of trained on more abstract stuff. Um, Ultimately, didn't get very far. I couldn't really grok uh, vector very well. So hopefully, we'll, we'll touch on that today. Um, but yeah, that's basically it. Awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely uh, go over vectors today. Um, Reed. Hey. Yeah, I had fun. I played around last night a bit. I was kind of bummed I didn't get a chance to mess around until last night. But I had a lot of fun last night playing with big bygan. Um, not really sure what that means. But I got some fun results. The inputs. It, I found that it like really wasn't super important what my input was, just kind of playing with the hue and the kind of parameters in the in runway gave me better outputs than choosing what my input was. So I, it was really cool seeing when you change the hue, it, if it's like outputting some kind of like animal or something, it will go from like lizard to fish to like crab or kind of like this weird scale. So I just output these and then made them into a GIF, but I was also curious about if there's ways to script or automate the kind of uh, process of like changing a parameter and exporting and naming and stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I had a lot of fun playing with it. And then one other thing I didn't like post too, but with the same model, I was playing around with putting in some like really like graphic inputs, like just like typography or like really just like black and white forms. And I was finding that I couldn't really get any output. So I'm kind of curious to, in the coming weeks, explore ways to maybe do explorations that are in black and white or more with just kind of like pure forms rather than like representative images. Yeah, Big Bygan is an interesting one. Um, I've been doing a lot of exploration with it this week myself. Um, 
I have, a, I have a video on how it works. Um, if folks are interested, essentially, Big BigBigan is a part as a sort of a side model to a thing called BigGAN, um, which is also available with Inside Runway. BigGAN is um, Google's like sort of big, huge GAN um, library, which is why it's called BigGAN. Um, so they just because it's big, um, and it works with a ton of different images and classifications. So what Big BigBigGAN tries to do is it tries to find the nearest representation of an image you provide it to uh, the big GAN model. And it doesn't really do it, it w does it well in some ways and it does it poorly in others. It mostly tries to find like the largest sort of what we call features or, con or like contrasting shapes or, or things to it. So um, yeah, like it is very finicky and you do not have a lot of control over it, but it does produce really weird fun stuff. So um, it's definitely worth playing around with. And I think the more you play with it, the, the better of a sense of sort of how it works like happens, um, which is true of a lot of this stuff. You sort of slowly get like an intuitive feel for how it works. Um, one thing I try with BigGAN is blurring things just ever so slightly, like adding a pixel or two of blur. Um, I tend to find that it uh, will generally pick up on those features better. Yeah, almost all of these things were used. But I made I used Blur to get these results. Yeah. Cool. Um, Darian. Um, so I just kind of wanted to play around and get a feel for some different models. So I just used um, the same photo a couple of different times just to see what different outputs I could get. Um, and I thought it was a pretty fun exploration. There were a lot of models I wanted to use that had the vector input and I was just like super confused. So I'm excited to dive into that more. Is this last one big by again? Um, I, I can't remember. <laughs> Because I almost wonder if you like input this image into Big Bigan and it gave you back this dog. It almost looks like that. Um, yeah, but it's it's cool. Um, yeah, there's lots of good exploration here, and um, we'll definitely cover vectors uh, this week. Um, John. Hey. Yeah. I, I admittedly, I'm a bad student this week. I uh, didn't really uh, have much time to explore since our last lesson, but I did have some older sketches, and I thought I would just share for the sake of showing something that was made. Um, so this is probably going back to like early March, I think. Um, but just a little sketch I was exploring. Uh, I, I can't really remember which, it, I can't rem remember which uh, model I was using, but it was like a space, outer space generator type thing and I stitch it together to make the video. Yeah, it looks like, um, like it was StyleGAN. Um, and there are so. lots of new ways to make videos now inside a runway using StyleGAN. So we'll definitely touch on some of those. Um, awesome. Probably not this week, but next week will for sure. Good to hear. Um, Grace. Hi, um, I played around with the text image a bit and that was a lot of fun. Um, and then I generated some clouds and put that into the flower um, network and then put that into the by began network and then like re uploaded that and put it again through it. So there's this nice progression of um, what started as clouds to the final product. Yeah, those are cool. Yeah, and we'll look at um, chaining today, which I think will also maybe, it doesn't actually help uh, in the sense of like making stuff, but you can sort of build a workflow in and then um, play with it that way. But yeah, these are cool. Um, ben, I can already, I'm already worried about this, but this is great. Uh, hey, yeah, so initially, uh, the first thing I was playing with was a text one that was like campaign generator, um, ad campaign generator, um, where you just type in like a problem and it, I can like post something that I found in there. So that was fun. And then I just kind of like looking around for different, different ones and found, found this one, which was like alternates between two, two faces uh, and like combines them. And so uh, it prompted me with like, uh, you know, like drop two files in the top left and right. And the only photo I had on my desktop was this Laura Palmer, the Laura Palmer photo. And then I was like, oh, what happens if I like take off my glasses, like try to match it a little bit more and like see what happens. And uh, all the results were horrifying. But I thought it was interesting that it like, what it pulled and like that part of the bangs are attached, but like not the rest of the hair. And I'm guessing the background probably had to do with it, but it was interesting. Yeah, it's also really interesting that like 
you have way more lipstick on than, than either of the photos do. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of these models, you know, it's kind of funky to figure out like, yeah, you kind of matched up the face structure a little bit, but yeah, it's interesting to see what it did or didn't, didn't get, yeah. Yeah, like it looks like the makeup, like it added like heavy makeup to my face, which yeah. is like, yeah, it says ended up being more interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that it did sort of give you like, you know, more of Laura Palmer's cheekbones. Um, but yeah, then it did some, it like also then took, you know, your jawline and added that. It's very interesting. Cool. Um, oh, and then Michael, you added some other stuff here. Cool, some other flower models. Awesome, glad to see people are getting um, good usage out of, the, out of that model because um, it was not the easiest thing for me to upload. Um, all right, awesome. This has been really great. Um, love seeing all the work. Uh, please continue to post stuff as you as you learn more, because um, this is really it's really fun to just to sort of see people what people make. It also helps me know like where I might need to do more explaining or where I need to record some videos to cover things. So um, this is helpful for me too, and then hopefully I can help you in return. Um, awesome. So let's go back to our class stuff here today. So um, let's go through some inspiration materials. So again, these are probably like some of the bigger projects you'll see um, folks doing inside of Runway ML. Um, and as I said, some of these are fairly complicated and others are um, things I would think that you guys could do or actually some, some things that students of mine previously have done. So just to give you an idea of sort of what another, you know, student in a five week class can accomplish or whatever. So um, yeah, so let's just go through a couple of these. So um, we're definitely going to look at StyleGAN this week, um, or not, not not this week, but more next week. Um, so we'll be doing some training in, in Runway. Um, this is uh, from a ceramicist by the name of From Fran. Um, she took photographs of her own um, pottery and then put them in a model and did this latent space animation and also generated like all of these funky looking um, pots. And I think the last time I saw of this project, she was also taking some of these pots with the weird handles and things and actually making them. Um, so again, there's also this like cool process of like, you can just use this as idea generation and then take it back into your own work, um, which is something that I really like about the idea of like machine learning. It's just a way to generate more ideas, but you know, the output is not just the, the machine learning model itself. Um, so we'll definitely talk a lot more about style again over the next uh, two or three weeks. Um, Janelle Shane, if you're not familiar with her work, I definitely recommend looking her up. Um, she is, she actually just put out a book recently. Um, I'm blanking on the title of it. It's bright green. Um, and it is all about all the weird ways in which machine learning like screws up or makes mistakes. Um, this is a video she did, which is again, using that model spade, um, that Claudio was looking at, except this does it. Uh, this is an example of chaining. So what this does, whoops. So this takes in uh, a Star Wars film it then does a segmentation process. So it breaks the image into segments, into like color blocks. And then it takes those color blocks and runs them through the model that Claudio was looking at, um, which then generates these really funky, weird looking faces. So it tries to guess what each shape is in an image. Uh, it then converts that shape to a solid color that is a, is a map of a certain um, type. And then it brings it back in. So like, you know, there's some really funky stuff in here. Like I think there's a moment where like he's holding a lightsaber and the lightsaber thinks it's a baseball bat. So it like turns it into like a brown wooden thing. There's just lots of funky stuff that you sort of will see with these models. Um, so this is a really great example of like taking two models that are supposed to work well together and chaining them. But like there's some funkiness happening between the between them. So um, just a really fun, simple, like, I mean, I don't ever want to call any of these projects simple because they're never that simple, but um, it's a fun sort of funny like way to like play with these models. Um, this is Fabin Rashid. Uh, this is again that spade model, except this is just for um, just for painting um, scenery. So Fabin is like a, a really great coder as well, and he coded up this um, web app that basically talks to Runway. So we'll look at this in the fourth figure class, how to talk to um, Runway models from a web page. So he basically built his own app in P5 to allow him to use a stylus and to generate images um, doing that. So one of the things that I think, Claudia, you might've noticed is like the drawing tool inside Runway kind of sucks. So there's a couple different ways in which you can play with it. One is a way like this, when you can use maybe Photoshop and send Photoshop images 
to and from runway. Um, there's an integration that we can look at again in the week in the fourth week of class um, to integrate with Photoshop. So if you want to do some work in Photoshop, send your image to runway, you get an image right back, um, stuff like that. So, uh, you know, I don't expect anyone to have the coding skills and or the time to generate their own web app. Um, but this is the, a thing that's capable within runway if you dig into the sort of the, the, the guts of the thing enough. Um, Adam Picard is a student of mine, um, although I think he did this work before he joined my class. Um, this is a style gam model um, trained on uh, stained glass. But what I think is really cool is Adam is a, is a 3D artist and an, an animator. And what he did is he brought the output image into a 3D, like into a 3D rendering program, and then used a lighting program to actually light it, right? So again, it's like taking it one step beyond just like the style gam model into like a way in which you're utilizing it, you know, in a new sort of technique or a new realm. So Adam does a lot of cool stuff. Um, I would definitely check out his work. He's on Twitter and like is pretty frequently posting stuff. He also posts a lot in, um, in the Slack channel. So if you ever want to ask him questions about things, um, I would definitely recommend that as well. Yeah, it is really cool. Um, Adam, Adam does a lot of really great work and is uh, very tireless in like sort of digging through things. Um, <clears throat> this is Andreas Refsgaard. So this is another style gam model. What I think is interesting about this one is it's trained on um, old, you know, tin type photographs. Um, so they have like this very like well sort of like common look and but they're also black and white so what he did is he trained the model on these black and white tin types and then he put them through the deoldify model um, which adds color to them so it's sort of like again this like double process but what i also think is really interesting is he probably trained it on like a very small data set and we'll talk about data set size and that sort of thing um, in the next couple weeks but like actually we'll probably start talking about it today um, but what is really interesting is like it, it jumps between these like scenes right there's no there's not like really a super fluid look to it but there is like just these moments where like this guy has three legs or like his coat is turning into a leg and then it jumps to another scene so i just think again there's some really interesting uses of using old materials in new ways um, which is a pretty common thing you'll see machine learning people do because you get access to lots of free data and it's all copyright free so um, that is one thing you kind of have to worry about not necessarily in this class but just you know as an artist in general with this stuff you have to worry about copyright and ownership and those sort of things um, this is another student of mine by the name of Nye Warburton. Um, Nye took this class three or four months ago, um, and he got really into like all the various models. Um, and he happens to be an animator, so he was just sort of um, using his animation skills to play with a bunch of different models. So um, this is a model called Dense Pose um, that tracks body shapes. So he did this, you know, with Beyonce's video to sort of track and figure out poses. And then he's doing all sorts of stuff here with like style transfer. Um, he's got some style gan. He's got like, uh, you know, faces talking like Beyonce, like just, you know, he's sort of got like a whole, um, a wide range of material here, um, but all some, some really cool stuff. And again, because he's, you know, knows video really well, he's able to pull this stuff in um, and able to sort of like bring this all into like one big music video. So um, some cool stuff. He also has a weird, oh, he's got a, he's got a Shatner gan as well. So if you're interested in playing with Captain Kirk. He's got some cool stuff there. Uh, Jason is another student of mine. Um, Jason is a designer in Brooklyn and he's like really interested in typography and he really wanted to train a, a StyleGAN model on typography, but it turns out that like, for whatever reason, StyleGAN is really, really bad at working with typography. So I don't necessarily recommend it. But what I thought was really interesting is like, he's sort of like, he's like, I kind of have a crappy model. It's got some interesting textures, but like not, it's not that great. So what he kind of did is he like took that model and then brought in his previous, what it was trained on. So he's able to generate sort of this cool graphic video by like sort of using materials. And like, even if he wasn't happy with the end result, he was able to find, find a way to make something cool out of it. So again, there are many times in which you'll like make something in, in machine learning or in runway that you'll kind of be disappointed by, but you can often find ways to like reuse it or make new, new, new materials out of it. So definitely encourage you to like, accept failure, but also find fun ways to like sort of keep moving with it. Um, April is also another one of my students. Um, April happens, you know, she's a, she's big into travel. Um, and this all happened right when we were starting to lock down. So she took some of her travel notebooks from her sketching things um, 
you know, she would basically sketch stuff and then she would find a photograph of that place that she sketched. And she sort of put these up in one image so that it's like you have the sketch on the bottom two thirds and the image in the top one third. And then she trained a style game model on it. And what she got out of it was really interesting in the sense that like sometimes these like videos look like they really sort of like the style game model kind of learns that they should be correlated, but also doesn't. So like in this case, this one looks pretty close. Um, but then even in these other ones, you get details of things, but like it's not the same thing. Um, so I thought this is a really cool example of, again, like doing sort of two images out of one, which I've actually not seen many folks do. So I thought it was interesting to see that. Um, and then her final sort of project was to take those drawings that were produced in, in a style gam model. Um, she then vectorized them and actually redrew them on a pen plotter. So some cool, again, like one thing I'm really like a fan of is like, don't let the machine learning model be the end of your project, like do more with it after that. Um, so I really appreciate that she, uh, you know, took an extra step and like figured out how to do some fun drawings with these just out of a machine. So um, yeah. Any questions about any of that? All right. So those are, again, just some, some examples. I mean, I feel like most of the style again stuff you could probably do in, in the two weeks you have available to you or three weeks you have available. Um, some of these other projects that involve a little bit more of like coding and back end with P5, like would definitely take more work, but um, lots of opportunities to explore things uh, here. I have one question. Uh, yeah. The one previously, I think it was with the type and it was like in black in like black and white. Um, that one you mentioned, he combined some like a pre-existing one he already had over just typography or um, do you know exactly like? Yeah, so, um, so basically the letters you see are what he trained the model on. Mm -hmm. And when you train uh, StyleGAN on text, it just turns into a lot of blobs. Um, Kind of, I kind of understand some reasons for that, but anyway, that's what happened. So then he took, like, you'll see sort of the blobby shapes. He took that and brought it into After Effects and then played with sort of layering techniques um, over the original data set. So it's sort of like you're seeing the two merge together in some way. Okay, yeah, thank you. Cool. Um, I just had one other question too about kind of like real-time output of things. I think I saw it somewhere in the Slack channel that someone was like using a joystick to control parameters of a model or something. I'm curious about like, the processing required to do that kind of stuff in real time. It seems like, is that something where like, it's kind of within a fixed set that you can explore images and it's not actually running the code. It's just like you're exploring images that are already created or is that actually processing something in real time? Yeah, I don't actually know. Um, I posted that because I was also interested in sort of trying to figure out. Um, I will definitely say that using Runway in real time isn't really possible. Um, Runway is like runs on slower servers. So in general, it's not really possible. Um, I also had someone just this week in Slack sort of say that they got real time working um, and they were going to upload a notebook or upload some code, um, which I haven't seen yet. But uh, I hope, I feel like we're getting closer and closer to it. Um, in general, running this on your own system is pretty intensive. So um, for StyleGAN in particular, you need a 16 gigabyte GPU, um, which if you know anything about GPUs, that is a lot. Um, that's like a, at least a $1,500 GPU, um, brand new. So. Um, it's definitely a, a big, uh, a big cost um, for those sort of things. So, usually, what I tell folks is like, play with Runway for a couple, like you know, a couple months, then move to Colab or um, you know, a hosted server system. And then, if you feel like a year in, you're still really excited about this stuff, then you can start to build your own rig. Um, but they are pretty intense. I mean, I've built my own machines, and I usually usually around twenty five hundred, three thousand dollars to build, um, and that's with a single GPU. Um, and that, you know. It's not the best, it's like, it works, but um, once you get one GPU, then you wanna get four GPUs and then it gets really expensive. So um, yeah, the, the COD, the, the, it's pretty intense for these things, but you can find um, cheaper solutions either through Runway or other places um, as you get more invested in it. All right, so <clears throat> let's, um, let's take a look at vectors. Um, so I know a couple of you mentioned that you had played with some style game models and we're sort of like, what is a vector input? How do I play with this thing? So in order to talk about this, we're gonna talk a little bit about just, um, we're gonna talk about a thing called latent spaces. Um, and latent spaces are kind of a conceptually, like once you wrap your head around them, it makes a little bit more sense. Um, so let's look at something like a grid. Um, so let's look at like a two by two grid and imagine that there are a bunch of points um, on this grid. So at any one point, um, let's say at this point, 
uh, we get a picture of a face. So this is essentially what a latent space is. Uh, StyleGAN has 512 dimensions of a latent space, which means it's three dimensions, but like way, 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 way more. Like our brains just can't wrap our head around anything beyond three dimensions or four dimensions. So don't try to, just imagine everything like as a 2D grid. Um, and that basically at every point in the space is a representation of an image, right? So at this point, we get this image. At, the, at this point, we get this image, right? So um, the idea here is that the closer you are to points, right? So if we look at these two points, you get images that are closely, closely related to each other. Um, and then as you get further away, you get images that are further away from each other. So this is FFHQ, which is like the big StyleGAN model that um, comes default with every StyleGAN uh, usage. Um, so the faces you're seeing here are represented are from, they've been trained on 140,000 faces that they pulled from Flickr. Um, so you're seeing the outputs of this model. Now, realistically, like there is no 2D space. It's, it's really like super high dimensional, um, but this is an easy way to sort of represent it, right? So like things that are further away from each other are, diff are more different. Things that are closer to each other tend to be more similar. Now, <clears throat> if I want to go from this point to this point, and I want to travel in a straight line, and I want to take every single point along this line, um, what I end up with is an animation, right? So this is an interpolation. So here people talk about an interpolation. And all that means is that we say, hey, we're going from a single point in space to another point, and we're going to travel and say, like, take 60 of those frames between each of those points. Um, so this is how we do animations with vector inputs and latent spaces. Um, so StyleGAN is a model that that is most, I mean, like I would say like half the models inside of Runway are people have trained their own style game models using Runway. Um, so you will see vector inputs quite a lot because of that. The other model that uses vector inputs is BigGAN. So any of, um, most of the GANs that you'll hear about usually use vectors as an input. And the way that we make these vectors is during this training process, um, the model learns what features, and by features I mean like edges, uh, textures, colors. Um, it learns sort of a representation of all of these within an image data set. And then it sort of moves these things into clusters, right? So again, you can think about like, um, you know, maybe green backgrounds or gr grassy backgrounds are over in this area. Um, <clears throat> or, you know, um, facial hair is in this area. So again, think about this as many, 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 many dimensions but all of these are sort of clustering different parts of it, right? So if I'm in this space, but I'm in a multi-dimensional array or whatever, um, it could be green backgrounds with black hair and olive skin. Like, so you can sort of think about it that way. Um, so that's how all these representations work. Um, and as you train on new things, it learns new representations of those models, right? So that's why we have a Simpsons model, we have a face model, we have a space model, we've got all these different models. It's all different representations. Um, but like, for example, if I'm in FFHQ, which is this face model, there's no Simpsons corner in that model, right? Because it's only seen faces. So it's important to think about that and, and remember that. <clears throat> um, okay, so, you know, we're talking about this in two dimensions. Um, realistically, StyleGAN has 512 dimensions, which means like, we can't just go through and pick each individual dimension. It's like way too hard for us to, to think about that. So what, um, what Runway has is, let's skip, over, let's jump over to Runway. So Runway has what they call a vector input. So um, if you look for a model, um, most of the models in here are gonna be StyleGAN models. But what you can do is you can come over here and you can click Community StyleGAN. So if we just click to the community model, you'll see a bunch of models in here that other people have made, right? So we've got a footwear one, we've got a cloud one, um, we've got Simpsons, you know, we've got a bunch of, we've got photorealistic insects, letters, those sort of things. So let's just pick one of these. Let's, um, let's pick the cloud one. Mm, actually, you know what, hold on. I wanna find one that's a little bit easier to understand. Let's just do, let's see if the face model is in here. Yeah, so let's use this. 
Um, so we're going to go ahead and pick style GAN from a model here. Um, and you'll see over here, there's a bunch of different checkpoints. So these are all different models that you can use within, um, within this particular style GAN model. So let's, um, let's do flicker faces. So this is the, the faces model that I just showed a couple images from. So we're going to choose this. Now there are other ones in here that you could choose. You could pick flowers. You could pick um, some of these are the ones that I've trained on. You could pick dogs. Um, all of these will have different output sizes. It's important to know that like, excuse me, based on what you pick here, you'll get different output sizes. Um, but for now, let's just stick with our flicker faces. Um, I'm gonna turn on our runway machine. And this will take a minute or two to get set up. And while it does, we're gonna switch our input to vector. So um, there is no other input really for um, a style game model. You pretty much have to use vectors. So we're gonna switch to vector. <clears throat> so if you remember that like the grid of the images that I showed you, which is like things that are close to each other tend to look similar. That's sort of what they're trying to do here. Now it doesn't use um, the same sort of methodology that I was, which is like, this is right next to this. This uses um, a genetic algorithm to sort of like give you a, a level of diversity so you can like pick and choose from. Um, but so, okay, let's say we like a face and let's say that I like, um, say I like this, this person's face. Um, and I want to figure out how to find more images that are pretty similar to that, but like not the same. There is over here um, in the vector options, a thing called sampling distance. So uh, it's not really like, um, you might think that like one is like consistently like zero to one. Um, it doesn't really work like that. It's just more of um, an analogy. So your sampling distance here, if we turn this down and we have that image selected, we're going to see a bunch of other faces similar to this face. So this works with any style game model, right? You find an image you like, and then you try to find stuff nearby it, you can turn the sampling distance down. Um, now you could also, um, if you just want to start over from scratch, you can turn this up higher and then you can hit regenerate grid. And it's going to restart from a bunch of different places. Um, I tend to find that when you regenerate the grid, it tends to um, like give you a pretty diverse sampling especially when you start out for the very first time. Um, so now we're at a sampling distance of 0.65. And you'll see here that like, you can see how some of these images are close by, right? And also like as you move left and right, it'll generate new images. And as you move sort of to the left, like it'll show more images like this. Um, and as you move like further down, you'll see more images sort of like this cluster. So this is kind of like mapping this, but it doesn't, it's not the same as just like mapping vectors. Um, it's got a little bit of additional layer of functionality on top of it. Um, okay, so this is um, how you use sampling distance and this is sort of how you navigate these spaces. Now, let's say you like this image. Um, so we're gonna pick this image. I really don't wanna pick a child. This is get flagged by YouTube for that. Um, <laughs> uh, so let's pick this image um, and let's, so you can download this image by just coming over here and hit, click save image. So when you click this, you can name it, hit save and it saves it out, right? So uh, it is important to note that um, this is 1024 by 1024. Um, other models will generate 256 by 256 or 512 by 512 or I think there's some that will do like 360 by 256. Anyway, there's a bunch of different sizes and like the model determines the size. So just be aware of like, you know, you might be like, can I get the cats one, but at 1024 by 1024? Probably not. Um, okay, so that covers downloading an image. Now you can also save out the vector um, and we'll use this uh, later in like week three or four, um, week four. Yeah, so we're actually gonna use the vectors. So this, if I, if I click this button up here, so down here it saves the image, up here it saves the vector. Um, you can also load in a vector, which we won't do now, but basically you save it, you can reload it in a later date. Um, so vectors uh, will give you a number. Those numbers are unique to this model, right? So if I download a vector of this image in this model, and then I open this model again and load in that vector, I will get the exact same image. So remember, these are basically coordinate systems for images. So we're going to download this vector. Uh, this will save down as a JSON file. So we'll go ahead and open this. Um, I don't expect everyone to like have coding capabilities in here, but if you're interested, um, Sublime Text is the editor I use. There's a bunch of other ones. Um, but anyway, you open this in a text editor and here's what you get. Um, so let me actually turn on code wrapping here. View, word wrap. Um, 
Okay, cool. So what is this? This is 512 numbers between negative one and one um, as a floating point. Um, and this is how we do, this is how StyleGAN describes that image. So you can download this and use this and it will always be the same. So uh, what we're gonna look at is how to do this using P5.js. We'll actually be able to send this vector value to and from uh, runway. And that's basically what we'll do um, in week four. That's a little bit more of an advanced topic, but that's what we'll do. So just be aware, like you could actually download this vector and look at it. Um, this is a non-human readable number. So like, you know, there's no like inherent value to this number other than it describes a point in a space. Um, so that's, that's how you get vectors in and out of runway. Um, one other thing I wanna talk about is truncation. So there's another value here tr called truncation. This is a um, thing specific to StyleGAN, but all StyleGAN models come with it. Uh, truncation is essentially, it's uh, a very math heavy uh, te technical thing, but essentially the smaller your truncation value is, the less diverse your images are, but the more likely they are to be realistic Whereas the larger your number is, um, the more diverse of an image output you'll get, but the probably the weirder your results you'll get. So let's start with a 0.1 um, for the truncation value. So you'll see uh, immediately that, that that face that we had there before changed. And that's because um, we changed the truncation value. So it still has the same vector. Um, if I were to download the vector, the vector would still be the same, but the truncation value changes a lot about this. And you'll see here that like almost all of these faces now look pretty similar with just minor color differences and maybe a little bit of texture differences. Um, but in general, like, you know, this is a very uh, realistic looking face. Um, so just be aware that like you get less diversity, but more realism. Whereas if I, let's put this to 1.0. So you'll see the facial, the, the, or not the facial, but like the, uh, the hair here gets weirder. And like, then you've got some other images here where like the faces look kind of like distorted, um, you know, really bad haircuts, uh, you know, weird eye shapes, that sort of thing. So this is how truncation works. And obviously like with, with a facial features or like a face model, um, it's really distorted. But if you upload like more abstract stuff, you might get kind of interesting things as you play with truncation. Um, so just be, be aware that like um, when we do the stuff with P5.js, um, where we're sending a vector to and from runway, um, we're also gonna need to pass in a truncation value. So basically truncation value plus vector in, is more likely like what the actual image you're gonna get back is. Um, so that covers vectors. Um, one quick, actually, let's look at this really quickly. So I know that some, uh, some people are asking about how to do video out of this. Um, you can generate videos using um, Runway and their, ex and their uh, style game model. Um, if you come over here and click export, this is gonna pop up a pretty new, this is actually really, really new. Um, they added this in a couple, week, a couple weeks ago. Um, they add this is like a really crazy latent walk generator. Um, so, this is like, um, you can basically generate your points. So let's say like, um, I'm gonna add another person. Say I wanna add the person here and I'm gonna add, let's see. Uh, let's regenerate our images. Let's add this person, oops, add one more and add another person. So now we've got like four points that we're gonna use. And then you can animate between these using different um, easing methods. You can also change the time between these points. So maybe I want five seconds between each of them. 15 seconds is pretty long. Um, it's gonna feel pretty slow. Um, so you can do this and then you hit export. Um, you can set your frame rate, you can set a truncation value. Um, you can set a bunch of other things here. When you hit export video, it's just gonna generate an exported video of, out of it. Um, so this used to be a thing that I would teach you to do in P5.js that Runway has now, thankfully, just put into their model. So uh, when we do this in P5.js, I think we'll look at how to use like audio signal to interpolate um, a value. So we'll do some cool advanced stuff while they keep advancing on us as well. So, um, but just be aware you can generate video from this. Now, you can only generate video really from, um, from style gam models because of how Runway works. Uh, because of this like interpolation value. Um, so other places to do video, you sort of have to upload individual frames or upload a video and I'll spit out a bunch of frames. There are some models or there are some tasks or quick actions inside of Runway that'll allow you to generate video, but not many of them. Um, generating video is a little bit of a trick uh, thing for um, this stuff.
So, um, any questions? Even, Go for it. Are there quick actions even just for generating sequences of images for ones that don't support video? Um, there are not. Well, so, okay, so the, so the way to do it actually is if we go, let's pick a model here um, and let's pick, um, sorry, I think my search bar is hidden. Well, okay, so let's pick Munit. Munit doesn't support, um, you know, and it's not a vector input, right? You, you put in input images. What you can do, however, is if you hit export again, in this particular model, you get a browsing system. So what you can do here is I believe you can actually upload a video. So let's try this. Let's upload a file. I happen to have many, many videos because of a project I'm working on this week. Um, so let's upload. I don't know what that is. Let's upload. Yeah, let's upload the jellyfish. So I think if you upload a video into Runway, um, it will turn those into frames for you. <clears throat> and then because of that, what you can do is once it's uploaded, it'll automatically know to output it as a video as well. So this is one way you can work with video. Now, one thing I'll note, and we actually do this, let's, let's actually try this. I don't think this is gonna look good. It's not gonna look seamless. It's gonna look noisy. Um, and let's just try this and see. But the reason that it looks noisy is because it's just sending individual frames, right? It doesn't actually know the frame before it. So it's just gonna kind of like interpret it as it goes. So this is something you'll see pretty frequently with a lot of machine learning models is there's no um, what we call motion consistency. It doesn't know the frame that came before it. So therefore it gets flickery. Um, there are ways around that in some models, but it's pretty tricky. Um, you have to do like some crazy optical flow masking and other things, um, which runway doesn't really support. So um, you can play with video in these things, but it's going to be kind of hit or miss depending on how it works. Um, any other questions about style again? Uh, I did have a question about the uh, checkpoints. So uh, over, the, over the past week, I generated my own model. Um, but when I search for checkpoints, I'm unable to bring in something like like Flickr Faces, for example. Is there something special you have to do to calibrate it to uh, to accept different checkpoints that are already built? Yeah, this is kind of a funky thing about Runway is if you train a model yourself in Runway, it only shows up in that model inside of Runway. So you basically add that. If you want to find the other one, what you do is, and I think we did this, um, look for, I don't even remember what it was called now. Um, if you go models, there is like a generic one that has a bunch of different uh, pre-trained models in it already. Was that one that I was just on? Uh, it might be this one. Let's see. Yeah, so if you just search for StyleGAN2, you'll see that there is like a generic one that has a bunch of pre-built models in it. So you have to use that model. This is where StyleGAN gets really confusing inside of Runway because there's so many versions of it and everyone has made their models public. So it just, it gets kind of messy. But if you look for like the official StyleGAN1 or StyleGAN2 repo, you will find these with um, some, some images in it, but then you'll also see like one of mine got in there somehow. So I'm not really sure how they like manage it. It's a, it's a pretty messy environment, um, but I would just dig around and try to find one that has multiple pickles in it. Cool. Okay, so let's take a look at how to do chaining inside of this. So um, as I mentioned, chaining is like a really cool and actually like probably one of the more awesome things to runway. Um, you know, it's not always helpful uh, in a way that like you would think it is, um, but it's also something that's like impossible to do in other places, whereas in runway, it makes it very, very easy. So let's do this. So let's, um, let's just find our, let's find big GAN. So I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna type big GAN. And I am going to um, add this to my workspace. So one thing that's important to know is that if you add a model to, if you're trying to chain models, they have to be in the same workspace. So I'm just going to come back here and I'm going to add a couple um, models here. So M to text. So M to text is a caption editing model. So basically uh, you feed an image and it gives you a, a, a caption. So let's add this to our workspace as well. And then let's add our attention gap model. So remember that attention GAN takes a, um, a text and generates an image from it. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're going to make a big GAN image. Oh, that's the wrong thing. Well, no, this will work too. Let's do this. Okay, so this is going to take a big, this is big 
BIGAN, so it's again that model that um, you feed it an image and it tries to find a close representation of that image. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna generate an image from an image, and then we're gonna take that image and we're gonna try to give it a caption. And then we're going to um, take that caption and generate a new image from that caption. And then what I think we'll do is we'll actually feed that last image into Big BIGAN. So we're gonna create like this feedback loop. Um, it'll be pretty weird and pretty wild, but it'll be fun to watch. So let's start. Um, one thing you can do over here is you can just click on and hit start all models. Now it's important to know if you have three models in your workspace and you hit start all models, you're going to be charged for every model that's running. So instead of five cents a minute, I'm gonna be charged 15 cents a minute because I've got three models running. So I'm gonna start all my models. Uh, interesting. Maybe this won't work. Let's see. Um, what the heck? I was just getting that error earlier too, and I just had to go to my preferences and stop all models running. Cool. That is helpful to hear. Let's just try that. Whoa, 11 models running. That's not true. That um, was what mine said. <laughs> you have 12 models running. I was like, no, I don't. I'll drop a note in the Slack channel. It sounds like that might be a bug. So let's go back to our workspaces. Let's see if this works for us. Um, start all models. Cool. So this should work. There is a max of five models. So you, even if like, that sounds like a bug, but this is like, if you do try to add five models, it will not work for you. So let's start, so again, so we've got um, Big Bygan. So for this, we're gonna upload an image. So we're gonna hit file and we're gonna upload a file here. Um, and let's see. So one thing to know about Big Bygan is uh, it squishes all your images to square 256 by 256. Um, so if you upload something like rectangular, it's just gonna squish it. Um, so I don't know if I have anything square at the moment. Um, yeah, well, let's try this. So this is a flower image. We'll upload this. So now this is running. And there's the image it found. Not bad, right? It found like a flower and it found another flower. So that kind of works. So let's plug this image into Imda text. So here we could switch this to input. We have the option of um, an input of camera, the input of a file, or we can turn it into one of our models. So we're gonna take the input from Big Bygan and plug it into uh, Imda text. So we plug that in, it says a vase filled with flowers on top of a table. So I don't really see the vase, but I do agree that there are flowers there. So now let's plug this caption into attention GAN. And if we come over here and we set our input to Imda text, one thing to note is that um, you can't plug in like big bygan, right? Because it only takes in text. So it's only showing you models here that support text inputs or text outputs, right? So an output from Imda text to an input of attention GAN. Okay, so here is our vase full of flowers on top of a table. Pretty good actually. Um, okay, so now let's do the crazy feedback loop thing. We're gonna take this image and we're gonna feed this image into big bygan. So if I go over here and it's at the top here. Cool, so we're gonna switch this to attention again. So now um, this is just gonna start running in like an infinite loop, um, which is fine. Um, but just be aware that like, you're not really gonna see the whole cycle as we go through this thing. So you'll see it's like blipping all the way through each of these, right? And we're starting to see how these images change over time, maybe. A tree in the middle of a forest. A tree in the middle of a forest. Hmm. Sometimes this, I feel like maybe we got stuck in, a, in an area where like it just kept repeating the same image. Um, sometimes I've gotten this to actually uh, do something where it just repeats for a long time. So let's actually edit this and let's say a dog in the park. Maybe. Nope, it looks like I can't break out of this loop. Let's hit stop is, here. Go for it, yeah. Is it doing that because the input is into text so you can't like, like kind of stop, like put something in there instead? Yeah, I don't know. I think it's just because I stopped the model and now I need to like restart it and maybe I can edit this and change it. Oh, you're right, that is exactly why that is. Yep, now I understand what you're saying. Yes, it's because this is set here and I need to set it to text. So let's break out of this um, and let's change this to be um, a dog in the park. There we go, thank you for catching that. Um, so now we're, we should be have a dog up here. Yeah, wow, that's actually a really good, but maybe not safe for work dog. Um, <laughs> and now we have a dog and a cat standing on a rug. Okay, so now we can try again. Let's try to switch this to our model input 
And let's see if we get a cyclic loop again. Yeah, so now we're getting like a nice loop here again. Um, so again, maybe sometimes it just starts into, it and ends up in a place where it just is, keeps repeating itself. Um, yep, see so here we ended up again. Interesting, so it like, it really loves producing um, a tree in the middle of a forest. Uh, so, um, but basically this is the fun of chaining, right? So now clearly like I was forcing it into a recursive loop and that was like fun, but like maybe not a, maybe not that interesting of a project, but you could find a way where like, maybe what you wanna do is just input, um, like you just wanna set file inputs and you just wanna set a file, um, you have a, a folder of 500 images you wanna feed through this and you wanna maybe export out the attention GAN side, right? So you use this to basically feed to that system. Um, this to do outside of runway is like a nightmare. Like I can't tell you, this would require like three different GPUs, like a whole bash script thing to like run around. This would be really, really hard. So this is a cool thing that, that Runway like basically gives you for free that is really hard to do in other places. So um, I definitely recommend playing with this and sort of seeing what you can do. Um, you might be able, I've never actually tried this, but you might be able to export out each level. I don't think it's actually gonna work. I think you would have to like basically have one level of export um, and another. So like it might be kind of cumbersome to actually generate a bunch of images this way, but I still think it's fun to play with and explore and see how each of these models mutates. It's like a game of telephone where like each game, each model mutates the thing a little bit more. Um, so some really cool stuff to do here. The only thing you have to remember is that your output from your, from your previous model from a model a has to match the input from model B. So just be aware of that. Um, but that's pretty much it. So that's is, um, that's chaining. You can do it with a lot of different models um, and I definitely recommend playing with it more. Um, so I think we're right on time here. So why don't we stop um, and take a five minute break. So get up, uh, stretch a little bit, take some, have some water, whatever you need to do. Um, and we'll come back at five after. Cool. Uh, one quick question. Yeah, um, go for it. So is it charging you for like three models or is it just like the time that you're running? It's charging me for three models for the time that I'm running those three models, right? So I'm being charged 15 cents a minute right now, not five cents. Yep. Yep. Cool. All right. So everybody in five ish minutes. Um, all right. So before we jump into data sets, any other questions about chaining, inspiration, vector inputs? I threw like a ton of stuff at y'all. So, like, for example, with the vector inputs, when we were going over the faces and there's all these different, like, so when we were showing the process of like make, of like making a video, like you would have to export every single one of those images around it. So it can kind of like blend into one another. Um, no, I mean, essentially I would just use that latent space, mm -hmm. the, the export where you actually generate the video from it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I would use that. I would use that if you're going to generate um, video. Um, what, I do have some scripts if you want to generate stuff using P5.js where you can look at the code to actually like basically it uses um, it uses uh, not NumPy but NumJS to actually generate. Um, basically, you can imagine an interpolation is just like, you know, point A, point B, and then some math to figure out the positions between those. Yeah. So you could actually manage, if you want to manage more control over things, you can do it that way. Okay. Um, but I think the the features inside of the runway stuff has gotten a lot better. Like I don't have any easing scripts in my stuff. So like if you want to do easing, like you're better off using um, the runway tools. But yeah, it's sort of like all this stuff is so new that there's no like real like full on tool set yet for a lot of this stuff. Like I feel like, um, have you guys played with GAN breeder yet? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, cool. So let me, let me show you GAN breeder. Um, although I actually don't use GAN breeder that much, but I know lots of folks that are really, really into it. Um, so, or I guess it's called Art Breeder now. Um, so Art Breeder is a site, uh, it's run by a guy by the name of Joel Simon, who's basically sort of like taken a bunch of style game models and found ways to like hack with them and do other things. Um, they now have like a, I think there's like a paid plan to actually like uh, pay for stuff, but you can start to like do really interesting things like upload your own image and like it will find like sort of the middle point between these images excuse me, you can generate videos from things. So if you're really interested in like playing with some of this stuff, I would recommend checking out Gambreeder. It is a little, I don't think it's pricey, but it's just like, it's an extra cost. Um, but there's some really cool tools built with inside of Artbreeder um, that allow you to do things that I am not able to do with my own code. So um, there's just some really interesting stuff in here as well. But I would definitely um, recommend checking it out and playing with it. I think there is like a freemium version where you can like play with a couple little models here and there, um, but it's definitely worth uh, checking out and sort of playing with more. Every week there's like a new like machine learning tool. So 
trying to keep track of the ecosystem is hard. I would say Gambreeder has been around for a couple of years now, like Gambreeder Runway, like those are probably some of the bigger ones you'll hear people talk about. Cool, so let's talk about data sets. So uh, this is great. The next hour is gonna be about data sets, which is perfect. Um, so data sets are like a very large and complex topic. Um, I'm actually teaching a whole class about it starting next month. So like, um, this could be a four week class just in and of itself, but I'll try to give you like the high level version of, of data sets. So um, next week we're going to look at how to train our own style game models inside a runway. So runway can train a couple different types of models, but the one that we're most interested in this class is gonna be style game. Um, so that means you feed it a bunch of images, it trains for eight hours, and then it gives you a model back that allows you to sort of interpolate between these images and learns different feature sets of those images. Um, this is what everyone, like, this is the fun part of Runway, right? Like, there's lots of pre-trained models, and those are cool, um, but I'm sure many of you have started to feel kind of limited in what you can do. Um, so training your own models inside Runway is what is, like, the next level of, like, fun where you can start to play with it. But you need a data set, and data sets are, like, the hardest part of this, but also, like, where you get to, like, put your, your own unique spin on things. Um, so data sets. A couple different ways to actually go about doing it. Um, the first is you can find a pre-made data set. There are many data sets online. Um, I'm happy to share some links. I think I might actually go over a couple here. Um, you can use those. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it because it's like someone already has those or someone maybe has already trained the model. Um, so you can look at those if you're like short on time. Um, what we're going to talk about today is scraping your own. So we're going to use uh, Instagram. So we're going to scrape uh, a web page. We're going to scrape a user's account and or a hashtag from Instagram to get a bunch of images down. Um, the other option is which, what I think I showed you of that ceramicist, which is like she photographed her own work and then fed her own work into the model. Um, this is clearly very time intensive, but you could do it. Um, so we're mostly because of, we're, because we're short on time, we're going to mostly focus on this for our class. Um, and, we're, and I'm going to only show you how to scrape Instagram. Um, I have videos on scraping other sites. If you're interested in scraping Flickr or Pinterest or other things, there are ways to do that. I just tend to find Instagram is like fairly straightforward and pretty easy. Um, so we'll be using we'll be using that for this class. Um, if you have other data sets you want to pull from, just like ask me, and I'm happy to try to help set up a way for you to do that. Um, but just know that like I think Instagram is probably the easiest to scrape from. Just a quick question about data sets: How many images would normally constitute like a good like starting point? That varies depending on who you talk to. Um, so I would say for runway, you want at least 500. Um, and we can talk about we'll talk a little bit about how to like get to 500. Um, but yeah, I would say about 500 is, is a good place to start. Um, I've seen people go as low as 100 and they still get good results. Um, if you talk to like a serious machine learning researcher, they tell you they, they need 20,000 or more um, or even higher. Um, I don't find that that's really true. It just depends if you want realism of like, so again, those faces look really, really real, right? They trained on 70,000 unique images and then they did a mirror flip to make them 140,000. Um, that was a very serious data science project that, so that they could show they could reproduce faces at high fidelity. You and I are going to fuck around and make art, so like we don't really care. Um, but we will talk next week about some issues that you might run into if you go too small of a data set, or if your images are too similar, other things like that. So we'll talk about that more next week. But yeah, I would say to shoot for about 500. Um, I feel like 500 to 1,000 is like doable within Instagram, um, but it's like definitely a little bit of a task to do that. So um, if you want to just find a data set, the way I recommend doing is just like do a Google search. So try like shoes data set. There are probably like 50 shoe data sets if you're interested in doing shoes. Um, some of them have resolution issues. Like many of them are like 128 by 128, which is pretty small. Um, style GAN, I should say, if you want to do the highest resolution inside a runway, that's 1024 by 1024. So again, this is why I kind of recommend Instagram because Instagram produces 1080 by 1080 images if they use a square setting. Um, so that means you've got a big enough resolution for most of your images, um, which is, again, just like why I tend to go to Instagram. If you try to do some like scrape Google images or something, you'll get a lot of small stuff. So Instagram just is a nice, like, it's a nice default. You'll know you'll get lots of decent images um, and you'll be able to use those pretty readily and pretty free, pretty, pretty easily. Um, but yeah, you can do a Google search and find a bunch of data sets. Um, here are some really well-known ones. I'm not actually going to go through these. I have previously, but like most of us don't care. If you're interested in data science, there are like, these are the famous data science sets. Um, so if the HQ is we already talked about, that's Flickr faces high quality, says 70,000 Flickr faces pulled from like the Creative Commons stuff. 
Um, Celeb A is like another famous one. It's a bunch of photos of celebrities. Um, ImageNet is what BigGAN is trained on. Um, ImageNet is something like, I think, a thousand classes of images, so a thousand different types of images, with I think like anywhere ranging from like 100 to 200 of each image. So there's like, you know, 10,000 images in this data set, um, a ton of stuff, actually, probably like 100,000 images. Um, so these are ones that like really well known, like research labs will use to like prove that their model is the best. There is, however, this cool list of public image data sets. Um, if you know who Golan Levin is, um, he's an artist and researcher and he teaches at Carnegie Mellon. He put together this really cool Google sheet of just like other like art sites where you can download images. Um, so you can always go through here and just like download some stuff. Um, I definitely recommend, recommend digging through it because there are some interesting things in here. Um, so yeah, there's lots of images if you're interested in just sort of like seeing what other people have collected or maybe just finding something that is interested, interesting to you. So you've got that page available to you. What we're gonna look at is how to scrape images. Um, so we'll look at this in just a minute. There are some Chrome extensions if you wanna try to find like an easy easy mode. Easy mode would be like Pinterest. So if you go to Pinterest and like search for, a or for an image or something, um, there is a Pinterest bookmark. I think it costs like $3 a month. So just be aware you have to pay for it, but it is pretty easy. Um, if you go to like a Pinterest page and you see a bunch of like, uh, I don't know, couches or carpets or something. If you like click this button, it'll download all those images for you. Now, again, some of them have resolution issues, some of them don't. You gotta, it's just gonna be kind of messy in the sense of like, you'll get a lot of images. Um, Runway doesn't actually care. We'll talk about this in a minute um, and about how to do what we call data augmentation. Um, Runway doesn't care if you feed it a really small image. Um, so if you set your settings to 1024 by 1024 and you feed it a 400 by 400 image, it's just gonna blow it up and like make it work. So, you know, you could try using like just a bunch of random images. It'll be pretty blurry. You won't have like the best like output, I would say, um, but you can do it. Um, I'll sort of teach you some techniques to make sure we get the highest images possible. Um, but everyone's like, I've seen people just throw stuff at everyone models and sometimes they get cool stuff out of it. So you never know. Um, there's also this Google images plugin, which I believe also just downloads um, a bunch of Google images or like, uh, we'll download all the images on a page. So you can play with these. This one I think is free. This one costs money. So um, you can sort of try with these and sort of see uh, see how they work for you if you're not interested in command line stuff. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to teach, I'm going to quickly demo how to use Instagram Scraper. There's a whole video tutorial here on how to install it. Um, if you're on a Mac, you do have to install this thing called Anaconda um, and then you have to install Instagram Scraper. It's like a 30 minute process. So just be aware that like, if you want to scrape Instagram, it's going to take a little bit of time to get set up. But once you have it set up, it's like pretty easy to use. Um, so this there's a link for a video here. There's also a link for a video on how to scrape Flickr. Um, I think Flickr is a pretty great place to scrape because there's lots of good high quality photographs there. Um, it's a little old now. So, you know, if you're looking for something really brand new, like a certain model of a car or something, like you might not find stuff there. But um, if you're searching for a generic category, you will find lots of good stuff there. Okay, so let's look at how to um, scrape Instagram. So again, I don't expect everyone to like be comfortable with the command line um, in this class and I'm happy to help people um, if they need help. But this is a command line tool. So just be aware that like, you know, you're gonna have to get kind of dirty or somewhat dirty um, just to get to get these up and running. Um, so the first part is you're gonna wanna install this all. Um, I'm not gonna cover installation because it does take about 20 minutes to get it set up. But if you follow those steps, um, let me know if you're into issues. I'm happy to walk you all through stuff one-on-one, -on -one, um, but I just don't want to like take up 20 minutes of the class doing that. So watch that video. That'll get you installed. Once you have everything installed, you'll have um, a tool called Instagram Scraper um, set up to go. Uh, let's just, um, so if you're not familiar with the terminal, the terminal is just like, it's kind of like an access to your finder, your folders, um, but it's using text. So um, in this case, uh, I'm currently in my home folder, which is the tilde. So that correlates to this folder here. And you'll see that if um, I've got a bunch of files in here, if I go to and type ls, um, it'll show me all, I have a really messy file structure, but it'll show me all these files here, right? So um, all you need to know for terminal is that you want to go to the folder you want to download the images to. So what I would do is like, let's go to desktop and let's make a folder. Um, does anyone have a, have a topic or a thing that they want me to scrape on Instagram? It could be a hashtag, it could be a, a person. Okay, well, we'll just, I'll find it. I'll find someone that, I, that I'm following and we'll scrape their stuff. Um, and they'll be surprised when I do it. 
Um, so let's just call this folder Instagram scraper. So uh, the easiest way to move folders inside of uh, Terminal is you're just going to click on the folder. You're going to hit Command C, which is just copy. So we're going to hit come over here. We're going to hit copy, and then we're going to come over here into Terminal, and we're going to hit CD, and then we're going to paste in that path. Um, so it's just saying move our whole like file where we currently are into Instagram scraper. So now I'm in this folder. So now to use um, Instagram scraper, there's a couple different things you can do. So the, the most common thing is you just type in Instagram scraper. And then let's go to Instagram. Let's hope my following list isn't too embarrassing. <clears throat> so let's scroll through here a little bit and see what we have. So one thing to know is that you probably want an artist or like someone whose work looks fairly consistent. So actually this person, I really enjoy her work and I think she has a good amount of images and her work is fairly consistent. So let's go to her page, Michelle Heslop. Um, so also what's nice about um, Instagram is it tells you how many posts they have, right? So I know I want 500 to 1,000. So like this is looking pretty good to me. Um, also clearly like has a lot of followers. So people must know about her work. Um, but you'll see just scrolling through her work like pretty consistent. Um, you know, every once in a while there's photos of kids or like her, you know, her family or whatever, which is pretty common. Um, Instagram isn't a perfect place to download stuff from. But I do like, you know, there's a decent amount of images that all look fairly similar. Um, so I think we can work with this data set. So I'm going to take her name, which is just her username. So I'm going to copy this username. And I'm going to paste it into um, this command. So Instagram scraper is all I need to say. Um, and then I hit just hit paste. And I'm just going to hit return. And what this is going to do is this is going to, ins this is going to basically like run through the page and download all of her images. Command not found, right? Because I'm not using Anaconda. So um, I cover this in the video, but basically we're going to use a thing called Conda um, or Anaconda, which is just, um, it's an environment setup. It's like a very um, nerdy kind of thing for folks, but it's helpful and it's like, you kind of need to do it just to like be able to work on a Mac. So I'm just going to do Conda activate Instagram scraper. That means we're going to use this environment. Now I can use the same command. So if you press up in a terminal, um, you will get the exact same uh, you'll get previous commands. Bunch of shortcuts here if you're interested in terminal shortcuts. Um, so we're going to run this again. This should work this time. Cool. So now it is searching her profile um, and is downloading assets. So this can take anywhere from 15 minutes to a couple hours, depending on how many images you're downloading. So just be aware of that. Um, this is a pretty intense process. Um, it's downloading images already, so it's found one piece of media. Um, now it's found 50. So if we go back into that folder, which is this one, we'll see inside this folder is a uh, folder called Michelle Hislop. And if I go through here, I will see a bunch of images. Uh, does it scrape any kind of like metadata or anything? And then you can, yeah, you can get it to scrape metadata if you want to. Um, this page, so this, this whole tool, um, if you just type Instagram scraper, I'll link to this in our class notes. Um, this is a, uh, this is just a GitHub repo um, with this tool. So there are different commands you can pass in. So I'm going to show us how to do hashtags as well. Um, but basically there's a bunch of metadata tools you can get out of this. So if you come down to this, all the settings here, um, options, you'll see there's a ton of different options. So I just typed in the simplest one, which is like a username, um, but there's a bunch of different things. Like one thing you might want to know, and this will probably actually be something that happens to me here, is I didn't say I only want images, so I might get video and stuff out of this uh, repository. So um, actually, let's do this. Let's, oh man, I think this is like slowing down my computer a little bit. So let's hit control C stops a, a command. Um, so let's actually do this. So let's, um, the way this works is that you want to pass in this argument. So dash dash media types. So let's press up <clears throat> Instagram scraper, Michelle Hislop, and then we're going to paste in Instagram or sorry, dash dash media types. And then what do we need to pass it? We need to pass it. Valid values are image, video, story, story image. So we're going to pass image because I just want images. You can scrape private profiles, but you have to give it, then give it 
uh, your username and password. And like, just for security reasons, I don't recommend giving a plain text system like this your username and password. So maybe don't do it. You know, if you really want to do it, like change your password, do it, and then go back and change your password again just to be safe. Um, yeah, don't don't send this thing your username and password. Even though I know like this is a good system, lots of people use it. I still just recommend being safe. So we're on this now. This is only going to grab images. So there's a ton of other stuff here. You can get metadata for different pieces. Um, you can get profile metadata. You can search by location. Um, so actually, if you go to Instagram, again, um, and let's see if someone has a location turned on. Lots of smart people who don't have locations on for their images. Actually, I don't even, it does, Maybe the web interface doesn't even show you locations. Anyway, you can get our URL. Your messages? Is it next to my messages? You see the icon? Oh, this here? Yeah. That's the Explorer icon. I don't know if we can get, so anyway, there is a way in here. If you go, um, like let's just type in um, Brooklyn. Come on. There we go. Um, okay, not what I wanted out of there. I wanted Brooklyn. Um, anyway, there is a place where you can get, uh, there's a URL for different uh, locations. You can pass the, there's like a URL ID, like it's like a long string of numbers. You can take that number and pass it in and get a location. Um, but let's do this. Let's, um, let's look at, um, let's do like watercolor. So we're gonna look at a hashtag for watercolor. Let's see how many images we've downloaded so far of Michelle's work. So we're at 350. Um, I'm going to stop this just because, like, this is a demo. Um, you would let it go until you get all the images or until you get as many images you want. So I'm just going to stop this. So let's do one where this time I'll take um, an image tag. So to do tags, um, if you don't, like, know what you're looking for, you can, like, go over here and, like, sort of Google or, like, just go to this page and just do a search for hashtag. So this is how hashtags work. So you, do you put in the word and then you do dash dash tag. Um, so the hashtag without the hash, so that's what we're going to do. So let's come over here. Now, before I do this, actually, I'm going to warn you about a thing that you should know about hashtags. Um, hashtags can have hundreds of thousands of images on them. So you want to make sure you set a maximum count. You don't want to download 100,000 images to your, to your uh, hard drive. It will definitely uh, be very annoying. So there is a maximum function, which is how many total images do I want to scrape. I recommend anytime you're doing hashtags that you set this because Otherwise, you will have a nightmare on your hands. So let's do this. So let's come over here. So let's do, um, so we're going to do Instagram scraper. And we're going to do dash dash tag. And then we're going to do watercolor. And then what is it? It's uh, maximum. Is that what we're passing in? Yeah, maximum or dash M. So dash dash maximum. And I'm just going to set to 500. You would probably want to set it to like 2,000 or 3,000. I definitely recommend over setting because we're going to do a lot of cleanup to like reduce our data set, but also get rid of a lot of crappy images. Um, as you probably know, if you have been on Instagram at all, um, lots of people abuse hashtags and like stick images in there that don't belong in there. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna scrape a whole bunch of images and then we're gonna try to clean it up as best we can. <clears throat> so this will now create a new folder um, inside of that other folder, right? So this isn't running yet, but we will have a new folder in here called watercolor when this is ready. Um, I will say that uh, searching hashtags tends to take a little bit longer. Um, I think there's some like lookup that it has to do in order to make this happen. So hashtags tend to be a little bit slower to download, but you will likely get a more diverse set of things, right? So a lot of times you will like might like an artist's work, but they only have a hundred images of their work in there. So the one thing you might do is you might look at what hashtags they use and then try to like look by similarity or like, you know, maybe you want to dig around and try to find a couple artists who are all working in similar styles and you might try to combine those together, right? Um, you know, we can talk for a minute about ethics, like the ethics of scraping someone's Instagram account, not the best. Um, you know, we are going to put this through a style gam model and it will like come out as a different thing. So like if you're looking at like just pure copyright, like legally you probably are okay because you're using some like remix or like, you know, changing a thing enough. Um, but, you know, if someone busts you, like, it might not look good in, like, the eyes of the internet. So just think about, like, how you might assemble a data set. Um, you certainly could take an artist's work and use it 
but like I wouldn't recommend trying to sell your work after that. Like generally going to be kind of frowned upon. Um, but what I do think is interesting is like maybe you take a couple artists who are sort of similar in their work and you combine all those together, right? And now you've got sort of like an amalgam of different people's work and you're feeding it through style again. It's sort of like how many levels of difference can you get from a individual artist's work um, that you can scrape from? So this is where hashtags are good. Uh, you can scrape multiple like, uh, you know, usernames and then combine them into one folder. Um, there's lots of different techniques here to sort of like diversify your data set um, in a way that like feels a little less icky. <clears throat> so we're at 297 images here. Um, let's take a look at what we got. Now, one thing I, I already noticed and I already screwed up, um, I did not look for just images. This is fine. Um, it happens to be that in Mac, like I can do a thing where like I can just, you know, hit uh, this button and then I can do sort by kind and I can just delete all the MPEGs, right? So like uh, you can't input a, you can't put a video into um, style again. You could break it up into individual frames and upload that. It's sort of hit or miss in how well that works. Um, I've, I've got some videos on how to do that if you're interested. Um, so if you do only have a couple of videos and you want to try like splitting those up into frames and then uploading that in a style again, you can definitely try it. Um, I tend to find that it repeats the video itself uh, in many ways, um, but it does sometimes do some cool stuff. So this is now downloading. I'm going to go ahead and stop this just to be, um, just so we're not here waiting for this to scrape all day. <clears throat> so now I've got a bunch of images, right? And if I start going through them, um, which is, I definitely recommend that you like actually look at the images you download. Um, Cause it's kind of funny to sort of see what you get, right? So sometimes I get, this is not both, not a watercolor and like a picture of the artist, maybe not what I wanted. <clears throat> also again, not watercolor. So again, now we see like, this is what happens when you do Instagram, right? Especially hashtags, you will get stuff that is not at all. Cool. We finally got a watercolor. Like, so if one of four of my images is a watercolor, I've got a lot of work to do. So Clearly going through the set, this is gonna be an interesting data set. One thing I do recommend doing is actually like maybe before you even di dive into doing the scraping, just sort of look around and see what you have here. So like clearly these top posts are good, but as I get into more recent, mm, it's starting to get a little bit iffy, right? Um, like, do I like this style? Like I was hoping for more like beautiful, you know, like portraits of like, you know, this type of stuff. And instead I got like things like this or, you know, people's faces, very emo type of work. Maybe there are other better hashtags, right? Like maybe I could do um, landscape watercolor or, you know, landscapes. Like there's other things, like this is where, this is where it becomes like, this is kind of like you have to do some sleuthing to figure out what, what the best choice is. Now you could scrape all 10,000 watercolor images and then just do it all clean up by hand. That's a thing, you could do that. Um, you will be spending many, many hours doing that, but you could. Um, I often do do a lot of hand manipulation of my um, <clears throat> my pieces or like my data sets. Um, I basically sit in front of the TV all weekend and just like click, 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 open something in Photoshop, change the size or whatever, close it, that sort of thing. So it's very common. You do see a lot of people do that. Um, I'm gonna walk through just my general process for cleaning up these data sets, um, just so you're aware. Um, this also uses a tool that I have built, which is called Data Set Tools, um, and it is, uh, I definitely recommend if you're really interested in getting into this stuff more that you try it. Um, you don't need to uh, really use this because um, Runway will do a lot of this work for you. Um, so especially because we need square images, Runway will just crop everything to square for you. They'll just do a center crop. It'll just take a rectangle and crop it down. Um, that's good enough to just get started, but you may find that you wanna have more control over it in the future. Um, so I've got a library called Dataset Tools that does a lot of, a lot of this work for you. Um, I may have a video of this and a bunch of other Dataset Tools processes. So if you're interested in diving in deep, um, we can. I would say that for a lot of us, if we just wanna like go through and manually clean up stuff a little bit and get to 500 images, that's enough for this class, especially for, for next week. Um, but if you get really into it, you do wanna like sort of think about more about how to make, use your time efficiently um, and not be spending hours and hours deleting images from a folder. Um, so we went through the basic uses of Instagram. You can also scrape multiple accounts all at once. I should have mentioned this. You can just, uh, if you comma separate them, you can get that. Um, here's how to get uh, hashtags with the maximum value. Make sure you use maximum values on hashtags. I will say that over and over again. Cool, so data set tools, um, this is a library I have. This basically allows you to um, basically like 
with one command do a bunch of sifting and sorting of images. So my process for this is basically, first thing I do is I throw out stuff that's too small. Now there's some question there because um, what's too small? Like if you're an 800 by 800 image, are you okay with making that bigger? Um, if you have a 512 by 512, do you want to make that bigger? Um, you have to do a little bit of thinking about this. Um, but I generally will throw out anything smaller than 1080 just because I have Instagram. I know that I can get like a decent set of images. Um, so let's walk through the process. Um, this is an example of me using my favorite uh, account, Bone Bone. Um, <clears throat> good cat. Definitely recommend to follow there. Um, so when I scraped Bone Bone's account, this is probably over, this is probably like a year ago now. When I scraped Bone Bone's account, uh, I got 2,089 images. Some of them were videos, so I did have to delete them. Um, it's probably up to like 3,000 now. Bone Bone is, has a lot of photos, um, which is great. So uh, when you scrape this, like you see like, cool, I have 2,000 images, this is perfect. Like I can totally make a data set out of this, right? So now we gotta start by removing all the small images. And the command for this, if you're interested, um, is basically this. So what I did is I ran a command that said, you know, sort, um, sort all these images by size and the min size is 1024 by 1024. So you basically say my input folder of images is this input folder. My output is where I want to put them. And then the min size I'm looking for is 1024 by 1024. So this will go through every image in a folder and it will delete anything that is smaller than 1024 by 1024 and keep anything that is larger. Um, and that is on the uh, smallest side. So if you have a 1024 by 800 image, it will still throw out that 800. You could make this number smaller, right? So oftentimes if I'm like tight in terms of like data set size, I'll set this to 800 and then I'll just like admit to myself, I'm gonna spend an extra couple hours bringing stuff into Photoshop and resizing or maybe doing other things. So just be aware of that. So when I ran this command on Bone Bone, look what happened. I lost almost half my images. So one thing to remember is that Instagram moved to 1080 by 1080, maybe five or six years ago. So if someone has a really old account and they posted a lot of images, um, a lot of them will be too small, right? So here's a 640, here's a 640. Um, so again, like you will very quickly whittle down your image sets, which is why I recommend starting with a really, really big data set and then trying to whittle it down using these tools. Um, so just be aware of that. So now we removed all the small images. Now there's a couple of things here that I notice. Usually what I do is I'll generate, a, I'll create a folder of images, I'll click through a couple just sort of see what I have. Then I will run this process, then I'll go through the images again and sort of see what I have. So in this case, I happen to go through this, these images and I sort of saw that like, well, there's like some images of like weird grids of bone bone, that's not gonna work for me. There's images of weird people that I don't, I, get, I want a cat can out of human plus cat can. So that's the thing about this. Okay, so I, this is just like a subset of images that I have to keep in mind. My next step is to remove duplicates. Um, Removing duplicates is actually kind of a complex topic. Uh, there's two ways you can remove duplicates. One is you just like remove the images that are the exact same, which does happen sometimes. People will upload the same image uh, multiple times to an Instagram account or use different hashtags and they show up in multiple places. Um, but a common thing that people do on Instagram is they screenshot their own photo, then they re-upload that photo and JPEG compression gets added to it. And all of a sudden you do not have in the eyes of a machine, you do not have two separate, two similar, you have, they are two separate images. Right, one has a little bit more compression on the other. So there is a technique um, in my ddupe scripts, which is not listed here, but you can do what was called like a fuzzy match, which would basically be like, how similar are these images and how like, if it basically is a way to, to match compressions. Um, so you could do that. Um, and I've got a video on how to do that as well, if you're interested in, in that technique. But basically like, you do wanna remove duplicates. One of the reasons you wanna remove duplicates is that if you have too many duplicates, like say I had like 30 versions of this image, um, your model might begin to over-index toward duplicates. Um, so the smaller your data set is, the more duplicates you have in there, the more likely you are to like have it over-indexed toward certain things. So I do recommend trying to dedupe. It's a hard process if you don't want to use these tools. So sometimes it's just like look around and see how many duplicates you have and just, you know, if it's one or two images, it's probably not the end of the world, but if it's a lot of duplicates, you will have problems. Um, so when I did this, I lost, there were two images in there that I deleted, so that was, that was fine. From there, it became a process of hand curation. So again, these two images might look the same to you, but they're actually just very slightly different angles, right? Like someone had like the photo burst on and was uploading images. So now this is where it becomes like a purely hand curation technique. Like, do I want to delete these two images? Do I want to keep one, delete the other, this sort of thing. So almost inevitably, like you always end up doing some hand curation of your data set. 
And this is why I said like, hey, expect this to take you some time. Because if you have a thousand images going one by one through each one of them um, is a task. Uh, you will want to delete um, images like this. So like here is a case of where, you know, I had a paw and what really we're supposed to want faces. So like I just decided to delete uh, paws. Um, I didn't want any with Bone Bone having a mustache, you know, just my personal opinion. Um, and I didn't want any of these crowd scenes. You know, Bone Bone's pretty famous. I really just wanted the cat photos, not the, not the crowds. So this did take me time. I had to go through and one by one, delete images, delete images, that sort of thing. Um, so just be aware that like this will take time if you want to do it uh, well. Now, I'll also say that like I've seen a lot of people's data sets and they're very noisy, meaning they have a lot of crap like this in them, and they sometimes still do well. So like I would kind of recommend if this is your first time ever training, just do like the, I don't want to say the bare minimum, but like just try it and see what happens. Um, and if you get like really crappy results, then you might want to go back and look at your data set. Um, you know, I just think a, a, a trained style gam model, even a bad one is better than nothing. And knowing we have four weeks together or five weeks together, um, just keep, in, keep, in, keep that in mind. Like you don't want to go for perfection. Um, I know most of us in here are designers, so we will go for perfection, but just be aware that like you can start with a little bit of noise and it'll probably be fine. One last thing to discuss, which is not necessarily as important for runway, um, but is important to think about just in general of how you crop images. So in a lot of cases you will get rectangular images, right? Um, runway's default, if you just upload a rectangular image, is that it's gonna crop the center. So in this case, um, with the images we have, um, you know, this one on the left, fine. I don't really want a minion in there, but it's probably not the end of the world. This image works pretty well, but this one all the way here um, on the right, I don't really wanna crop out Bone Bone's eyes. So the problem with this is if I upload this and I get it cropped to center, I'm gonna lose, you know, Bone Bone's eyes here and it's gonna to focus too much on the body. So this is a case of where, again, um, it's totally up to you, but my technique is to run a command that allows you to crop the square and aligns to top. Um, so this would be a case where like, in this case, I'm happy losing a little bit of Bone Bone's feet in order to get, you know, all of my images to be like this. So this is an efficient way to check all of the images and always crop to the top, but that's not always the right way to do it. Um, you know, the best way to do it is to do it by hand. Um, that is a very inefficient process, but you could do it that way if you have a very small data set. Um, I tend to use these tools just to like automate it and then I can look through and see how bad it was. Um, there's lots of different ways to do different croppings. Um, the data sets tool library has like, got it, it has so many different crop functions because um, I keep building them for various uses. Um, so if you're interested in some of those features, just let me know and I can um, point you in, in the direction for that, for those tools. Um, data set tools is a, uh, command line tool. So like you do need to know command line. Um, but like I said, if you don't know command line and just don't feel like spending the next couple weeks learning it or don't want to deal with it, runways cropping tools are fine. Like they're, they're totally fine. I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that too much. Okay. Whew, that was a lot. Okay. So we've talked about data sets. Um, got 20 minutes left. Okay. Awesome. So this is basically the process for data sets. There is on my YouTube page, Oops, that's not the right thing, but it's fine. I can find it for here. Playlists. I will add a link to this. There are a bunch of data set demos. These are all um, videos around doing different data set techniques. So some of these will be uh, making a data set. Some of this will be installing the data set tools library, uh, different cropping and duplication techniques, as well as some other things. And then there's also some tools here about how to scrape various things. Um, so I'll link to this in our notes. Um, I also talk about how I use um, some tools in Photoshop to like generate like better images. So in some cases, you've got a rectangle that's 1080 by 800. Um, a thing you can do pretty easily is um, make it 1080 by 1080 and then use the edges using like a content aware fill. You can sort of fill in some of those gaps. So there's ways to sort of play with stuff um, to make things a little bit better. So um, I have some, a couple of videos here about my techniques. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about that, you can do that as well. Um, so yeah, I would say next week, your homework is to start making a data set. Um, this will be a long task. So I definitely recommend start thinking about it tonight, tomorrow. Um, and start going through the videos. I'm happy to help where I can. Just drop me a note in Slack or DM me, um, and I can walk you, like, 
we can help with some of the process if you're interested in anything. Um, but I definitely would start starting now because it will take a little bit of time. Um, like I mentioned, next week we're gonna look at training. So I will show you how, what, once you have a data set, show you how to upload it to Runway and start training on it. Um, you don't have to have a data set by next week. Um, you're welcome to sort of like take your time, um, but I would definitely recommend trying to get on it as quickly as possible because it will sometimes take a lot of time. Um, so with that, any questions? Um, maybe you already have a data set in mind or looking to figure out how to scrape it, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Go for it. Uh, one quick question. Uh, I'm curious from your experience or if you've seen this. Generally speaking, um, how does it tend to handle like data sets? If I were to take a video and uh, export all the stills and use that as a, an image source, is that something kind of worth exploring or <clears throat> I'm just kind of curious as a jumping off point? It's worth exploring depending on the video. So I actually have, um, there's a video here right here, which is about how to do that. Um, in my experience video, uh, so a couple of things I've learned over time, don't take every frame, take like every 10th frame, um, okay. or, or like, you know, take one frame per second, that sort of thing. Because um, remember if you think about clustering and like sort of duplicates and that sort of thing, the more data it has to see, the slower it trains. Um, and the more likely that images are really similar, the more it's just going to, what we call overfit or like, it's gotcha. going to memorize those. Sense. So you want like sort of big gaps between, between images, that way it gets more diverse stuff to see. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's what I would recommend uh, to start with. Um, I have some examples, I don't know where, they're probably on here somewhere, but I do have some examples of using video. Um, what I tend to find is that it, it does a really funny thing in that it sort of understands scenes, or like it understands, you know, um, between cuts it can like repeat that pattern, but then when it does a cut, it like jumps to a new section in like a really funky sort of way. Um, so I think there's some really interesting things you get out of video. It is very different than I would say than what you get out of doing like static images. Static images you get tend to get more of that interpolation feel of like going from one image to another to another. Gotcha. Whereas with video, yeah. it tends to sort of like repeat itself, but then like jump into weird areas. So it does a lot okay. of like bouncing around. Yeah. Uh, one thing I had a question about was uh, when you were uh, scraping, was it Michelle's uh, Instagram account? Those were mostly abstracts. Um, and I was just wondering when you actually go to model that, what, what does that look like versus um, what a model generated on cat photos? Um, yeah, try and find out. Um, so like, yeah, I mean, a little bit of what I'll tell you is that um, abstract images tend to obviously reproduce very abstract things. Um, and they, and so one way to think about this, or the way I think about this is that if you want really, really perfect images, you want to think about almost like onion skinning. So like the way that they did that, that face model is that the eyes are all aligned perfectly. So they wrote a script that found all the eyes and like adjusted it. So all the eyes match up perfectly. So if you watch the interpolation, the eyes never move or like they very subtly shift. Whereas like if I were to like do that and not do the alignment, like you'd get kind of some weird eye blobs. It would like kind of move around a little bit. So <clears throat> if you want super realistic looking things, you want like perfect like overlap where like all the features that need to match up do and all the features that are different are different. Um, that said, if you just throw out a bunch of cat photos, like here actually I can, sh I can show you what the, what, the bone, what the bone bone gan thing looks like. Um, let's see. Bone, bone, um, the workspace. Um, <clears throat> so bone, bone ends up being like kind of funny in that bone, bone has a pose. Like bone, like bone, bone's owner knows its angles. So there's this like a there's a bone, bone face, and then its body is always sort of in a different position. So this model, um, and we'll see it in a minute basically like the face is almost perfectly rendered and then everything around it is abstract. It's super weird, but I love it. Um, so oh, come on, here we go. Um, <clears throat> so this is again, like the other thing I would say is that you, there are not a lot of people out there training these models. So like we're kind of constantly learning as like the very first class I taught this with, like we got weird stuff and we had to figure out what was going on. Um, we're learning more and more about how these models operate like as we go on. Um, style games only been out for a year and a half, two years. So like, we're still learning how it works. But if you look at these images, so like, look, you'll see Bone Bone's eyes and nose are like pretty well represented, but like everything around it is kind of like a smeary blob. 
Now there's also a lot of photos in Bone Bones data set of like it's back turned to you. So there's ends up being a lot of these like very like textury like fur blob things. Um, but then you get again like these photos where like Bone Bone is like angelically portrayed and then it's just like abstract. I think it's pretty cool. I would love to see someone like actually paint Bone Bone like this. Um, whereas, so let me show you another model um, that is trained on more abstract images. <clears throat> So this is one where I did scrape an entire artist um, and all their work. This is uh, Freya Buckler, if you're familiar with her work. Um, there's a lot of graphic geometric images. Um, so let's add this to my workspace. And again, actually, let's look at her. While this, while this gets set up, let me just show you her Instagram page. I, only, I like half-assed the data set cleanup in this. Um, so you can kind of see like what happens when you do that. <clears throat> so you'll see there's just a lot of these very bright geometric images. And there's also some stuff like photographs um, or she tends to photograph a lot of stuff like at these angles or like on backgrounds or like a lot of stuff like this. So <clears throat> what you'll see is when I converted this to a data set. Uh, so one thing you should also know is StyleGAN does not do well with like straight lines. It turns everything into curves. Um, there's a reason for that, but it's basically like, it just turns everything into a mess. But what you'll see here is you get like these really interesting sort of shapes, but you also get a lot of these grid-like images. And that's because of the, the fact that she photographed a lot of multiples. Um, and I don't know if you can see it anywhere in here. I'm trying to see if I can find an image of this where it's, where it's really obvious. Here's a good example. Um, you can see that like the edges are sort of there, right? The paper is there. If I were to do this and I really want to do it like really, really clean, I would probably open up every image that had been photographed with an edge and I would either paint away those edges or I'd crop in on it. Um, and that would give me much more cleaner sort of results. Um, so this is a good example of like abstract is like gonna get even more abstract if you give it abstract imagery. Um, whereas again, with faces, photographs, you're gonna get maybe some realism, maybe not. It kind of depends on how the data set is set up. Um, another thing, I was gonna say another thing about this. Oh, so we'll talk about this more next week, but there's how long did you train the model for? Um, so training time is a big consideration. Um, the longer you train it, the more expensive it is, but ideally the better it gets. Um, so we'll talk about that next week. I generally start recommending like at least 6,000 steps for a training time and that ends up being about eight hours. Um, and that's like 30 bucks, I think, something like that. Um, so I generally recommend starting there, but I think I've trained a model like this. I don't know about this particular model, but I've trained some of these for like 20,000 steps. Um, and ideally, the longer it trains for, the better, the more realistic it gets. Not always the case, but that's the hope um, with these sort of things. So we'll talk about that more next week. But yeah, I think choosing between an abstract data set, a photographic data set, like these sort of things, a lot of times you just try it and see what happens. What other questions do we have? Sorry if I missed it, but what was the input for this model that you trained here? This is an artist by the name of Freya Buckler. This is her work. And it's you'll see like, really cool. you can see like this image like fairly well represented in this data set, right? Like you might not see the exact same image, but you can kind of see like it's probably got some pulled from some like this. I think I ended up with like 800 images in this data set. Um, but what's cool is like you do like, I wouldn't try to sell this artwork like because it is sort of like kind of stealing someone else's livelihood. But I do think that it's still different enough that I feel comfortable using it in like, so actually um, the video promo for this class was using like this data set and like manipulating it a lot. Um, so I do think like it's still my work or like I still consider it my work, but because it's all scraped from just one person, I'm a little iffy about like trying to make money off of it. So I just use it for promo and make money off of it in other ways, right? Like it's all like the whole ethics of this stuff is just so, it's so messy and confusing um, that I really sort of like, it's up to you, like do what you think is right. Um, I have my own take on what works, what doesn't. Um, but yeah, so this is, I just scraped this, this person's Instagram account um, and uploaded all those images that like, but I did, I went through it like and kind of like hand pulled out stuff like this, um, you know, cause I didn't really want like, I probably deleted stuff like this as well. Cause these will definitely make a mess of your data set, but I didn't like delete images like this. Um, whereas if I were really, really 
like super perfectionist about it, I would probably go in and like, you know, take images like this, or I would take an image like, um, like this, and I would like maybe distort it even in Photoshop and like get it back into the right perspective. But again, it's, it's everyone, it's like up to you sort of how you want to play with it and see how it works. Is there a way to use like videos as data sets if I have a whole bunch of videos that are very similar? Yeah, so I mean, I think if you have a whole bunch of videos, you can definitely combine videos. Um, as I was mentioning to John, it's like, sometimes it just repeats stuff to you. Um, and other times it like, it works sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. You just have to sort of try it and see how it goes. I do find that it tends to repeat a lot of sequences back to you. Um, but you just have to sort of like keep an eye on it and see how it goes. So we're not making the style again uh, for the homework, right? We're just doing the image click, like we're just going to collect the imagery. Yeah. So I definitely recommend this week, like um, depending on how much time you have, like start making a data set, but keep playing around. I would say keep playing around with, um, with the other models in there. Uh, so I know, Anthony, you said you started training. I think someone else has said they previously started training. Um, you're welcome to keep, if you're welcome to train your model if you want to. Um, next week, I will talk about some of the tips and tricks. So if you don't want to, you know, drop 30 to $50 just for the hell of it, like before then, maybe wait. But again, like you can, lots of people are like get excited and just want to do it. And that's totally fine. Um, and next week, also, I'll show you some of the ways that I know, or like some of the stuff that I know will work better than other things. So we'll talk about that as well. Um, I should also add that if you don't have a 1024 by 1024 data set, say you found something on like that goal 11 spreadsheet, um, and they're like 256 by 256, you can train one of those models. Um, I don't generally recommend it just because like, I feel like as designers, we want like decent resolution stuff. But if you just have a really cool data set and it's small. Like we can train on a small model. Um, I'll show you how to how to choose that next week. Um, but yeah, you can do that as well. So don't feel like you have to do 1024 by 1024. Any other questions? Cool, okay. Um, so yeah, this week, just start digging around, try to find data sets. Maybe you have like a small data set of like 200 images and you wanna figure out how to make them bigger. Um, I would recommend like posting in the Slack if you're trying to look for stuff. Maybe other folks will be like, oh, I know an artist is just like that or I know other images that are they might be able to pull from. Um, so yeah, definitely keep posting to Slack. Um, it's really helpful to see people's work. I think it also inspires everyone else to be like, oh, I could try something like that too. So um, yeah, so I would just say like, keep playing around. Um, and then please feel free to like drop a note on Slack or whatever if you have questions for anything. Cool. All right, awesome. Thanks everybody for another great week. Um, I believe this slide deck is already up on our um, up on our class site. So if you want to download that, there are links to all of these various tutorials and stuff in there already. So if you want to dig in, go for that. Um, I'll add some additional notes to our class links, um, and then the video will be up probably at the end of day today. Cool. All right. See you everybody next week. Thanks, Thanks sir. Thank you. Yeah.